Okay, can I? There we go. All right, let's. Uh, you ready? Always. Hey, folks, welcome to the BTB Beyond the Baselines.com podcast. And on the line today, I have Sean Boyce down there in Atlanta, Georgia. Sean, great to have you here. And uh, thanks for taking the time to be with us on Beyond the Baselines. Thank you. Um, Sean and I met because Sean, you started to come into our uh, Institute of Club Directors, t- uh, you know, luncheons and uh, free virtual luncheons. And you had some great opinions and great ideas. And uh, I wanted to get you on the line because you specialize there in Atlanta. And let's talk about Atlanta first. Uh, have you say, uh, as you have said to me, Atlanta is a tennis hotspot. Can you kind of put that in perspective for us? Because some of the numbers you told me were just incredible. It's an interesting place. It's different from anywhere else. And it's never a thing I've had to justify, so to speak. I've never had anyone directly, as you just did, say, hey, Sean, do you have any actual numbers to prove what everybody thinks? Uh, What we have here is an interesting scenario where weather and wealth and diversity allow us to play tennis all year long. So we end up with neighborhoods, and this is one of the things I'm getting involved with here in my own personal neighborhood recently, neighborhoods where I have two tennis courts and a pickleball court in my personal neighborhood, and we can use them all year long. And it's not part of a club, it's not a paid membership, it's not public, but it's not exactly private, it's not exclusive, but it's free. And tennis is is free in Atlanta, so we get used to that concept. So when we talk about, when you and I were talking about on some of the luncheons, it was interesting for me to get to know the not Atlanta areas where in New England and the nice clubs, it's an expensive sport. To play tennis is an expensive sport. In Atlanta, it's free. Yes, you can join a nice club and have access and pay extra for tennis lessons, uh, which everybody ends up doing. But in this case, it's a free place to play tennis all year long. And in that case, the business of it is slightly different. Right. Right. Hey, you said you have two courts in your HOA, and that's what we're going to talk start talking about. Homeowners associations, for those of you who do not live in one. I live in one. I think Sean lives in one. Um, mine has three clay courts. They just resurfaced them. They're beautiful. Um, I hope we have someone to maintain them. But I want to ask you, are you, so here's the, here's the question. Are you teaching where you live? And if so, how does that work? Interestingly enough, I'm working on that now. So our neighborhood is brand new. We built the house from from the ground up. Mm-hmm. So we moved in in May. The HOA takes over. We actually started our HOA board, took over in January of this year. So it's only been about three months that we've been dealing with our own neighbors as the HOA board rather than the builder initially. Right. The developer was the initial board and they make all the decisions until you get so many homeowners in situ as per the documents. And then they, and then you can take over. Correct. And they have a general, they have a general plan where they say all the neighbor, all the houses have to be exactly the same, no exceptions. They hire a, an HOA company and they outsource the management and enforcement of the HOA rules to a, to an external company. And that's all that company does. They are an HOA management company and they handle yearly dues. They handle enforcement of the rules and things like that. So we would keep that same concept, even though we took over from the builder, we would keep the same enforcement business, same management company to do the same thing because they're the ones when I say, Hey, my neighbor's got our garbage cans out again, we're tired of, you know, can you please do something about it? Cause you know, they're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, so to speak. Uh, then they're the ones that enforce it. So the neighbors don't have to pick fights with each other. In theory, we can outsource those, that enforcement. Right. right. And, and so therefore, when you go and you're approaching your personal HOA to work there, I, and I know you've worked at other HOAs, so we can go through that process, but obviously the management firm looks to, certain criteria for you insurance liability obviously being a a major one that they worry about but two your certification your three your history take us through that process and how how difficult it is to a get into the hoa management firm to say hey i want to teach on those courts there and b how difficult the process is interestingly enough neither the board nor the management company typically cares what goes on on the tennis courts really 
Really? It is, it's fascinating. When I, when I talk about what the management company does, they care more about whether or not we paint our, our the front of our house, the, the, the windows, the trim has to be the right color. Mm-hmm. They do not vet the guys that are out there teaching tennis on the, on the neighborhood courts. It is not a typical thing that's done. Now there are different types of neighborhoods. So I'll run through some examples. You asked initially, sure. do I coach at my, in my own neighborhood? Yes. <laughs> do I need permission for that? No, okay. I do not. I need to be able to go reserve a court, which is nice. And we have our court reservation system here that the HOA installed. We installed and said, okay, this helps with the courts simply nice and- reserving the courts. Right. Otherwise, I get a court, I go teach lessons. Management company I've had zero conversations with. Wow. Now with them, I'm, head, I'm the tennis committee chairman. Okay. So I'm head of the tennis committee. So I advise the board on tennis and pickleball amenities related things. So they I have know no actual, you. I have they no actual you. power. Right. But I'm the expert that tells them, hey, here's here's what I suggest to do. And I went out yesterday and, and put in the rules sign. So we're really early in our in our development here. But it doesn't cost me anything. There, there's no vetting process. Now, when I come into a different neighborhood similar to mine, so we're not a gated community. We don't have any programming here when it comes to amenities. So we don't hire a tennis coach or a tennis club director to run programming. Now, when we partner with, when tennisforchildren.com partners with a local neighborhood, uh, one example where we were yesterday is Windermere in Cumming, Georgia. They're a big group of neighborhoods. So they have five, I think they got 13 neighborhoods in that area and five or six that are directly associated with their amenities. They've got 10 tennis courts and six pickleball courts, and they have a full-time director of tennis that works there. Right. His, his job, same concept, HOA, but just a larger community. So they got a bigger budget to hire somebody for specific programming. And so that director of tennis hires me and tennis for children to come in and run their 10 and under programming. So they're running a full club atmosphere, right? They're running a full fledged club tennis facility with fitness and pickleball and the whole thing. Exactly. Now I have two tennis courts and a pickleball court in my neighborhood. It's a completely different feeling. It's a completely different concept. Now I offer my insurance because I've got a, there's a legitimacy to what I do in connecting with the HOAs because I'm fully insured. All of our lesson plans are USPTA. I've I've developed everything. They're all professionally done. I'm certified. Some of my other coaches are certified. Some of my coaches are just helpers. They're just high school kids that help and play with the kids and they love it. You don't need a certified tennis pro all the time. You don't need four certified coaches out there specifically to do what we do. You need someone who loves kids, which is, which is what you are, you do. And, and, and and I just happen to be both. Yeah. I happen to be both. I'm the professional instructor, but also happen to enjoy working with the kids. So it's a, there are different ways to do things where I've got my smaller neighborhood here and there are just some tennis courts here and people can call me up and say, Hey, who's running the tennis coaching Right. And I can be one of the coaches. Now, another thing about Atlanta that's unique is there could be a guy that lives across the street that's got a basket of tennis balls in his, in his trunk of his car. And he also teaches tennis lessons. He's not certified. Right. He's not that's, associated with any coach. He's that's not, my point. You know, yeah. if you're taking money on an HOA court, that's kind of a liability there. Obviously, your, your HOA is smaller, but I'm sure that the bigger one, I think you said Windermere. Yep. That that gentleman who runs it has, you know, vetted you, make, has gotten a copy of your insurance, probably done a background check, you know, those yep. kinds of things. So as you get into the bigger HOAs, it does get into that. But on the smaller ones, it's 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 one it's uh, it's not as tight. Sorry, say that again. That's OK. No, I'll, I'll let it out. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, is is that if you get into a bigger HOA, you really have to, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's. But absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let that, me ask you. Yeah, go that's ahead. That's that business, that's that business relationship that says, okay, you're on my courts, you're playing with our members, with our homeowners, playing with their kids. 
yeah, who are you? Are you background checked? Are you insured? And they're going to care a little bit more where our HOA in our neighborhood puts up a sign that says we're not liable for anything. Right, right. So let me ask you a question. So, you know, you, you're, you are a specialist uh, junior, you know, junior instructor. You love teaching kids. And that comes across every time I talk to you. Secondly, you're a real specialist with these HOAs. And, and, and you just mentioned that your house is brand new. You, you built it from scratch and you're in a relatively new HOA. And when you go to the bigger ones, I've only experienced, I worked at an HOA for three years, you know, I'll in, 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 I guess what it is in disclosure terms, I was the director of tennis and fitness at an HOA down Jupiter, Florida, big, big one, you know, 700 doors, um, gated community, uh, nine courts, two pickleball and a gym and fitness, massage therapy, that whole kind of Pilates, the whole thing. I want to ask you, is there, do you see a, like a correlation between pricing of the courts or of the programming and real estate prices, because HOAs, I think are oftentimes garnered are governed by what, you know, residents think they can sell their house for. What do you see as a connection between those two things, the pricing of programming and the pricing of real estate? Programming is a tough thing to combine in Atlanta because okay. like I mentioned in our neighborhood, the programming doesn't exist. So that's, there, there's no, there's no club atmosphere. There's no club programming, but yes, it, the amenities and the cost of it are usually directly related. It's you, you, if you look at some of the numbers and sometimes it's going to say, Oh, it's a hundred dollars for every thousand dollars of something. Right. So there, there are plenty of ways to kind of calculate what the, what the HOA dues are going to be in different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. They're higher when it comes to having more amenities. Exactly. Or, or if the homes have a significantly higher value, the HOA will often force you to have lawn care or force you to use a certain lawn care company. There are, there are quite a few different ways to do it. If we just keep it amenities focused, it really is probably less expensive here than it is Windermere because Windermere has the giant pool with the slide and the, the carnival kind of atmosphere and they have the big clubhouse space and the, the space for the Pilates instructor and the offices downstairs for director of tennis, even though it's an HOA style system, they still have the club atmosphere. They're gonna be paying significantly more yearly their HOA dues. dues. And you see, to me, and that was always the problem, is that some people in the HOA, say you take Windermere, for example, I don't know it, but just say, for example, some people move in there because they love those amenities. And some people move in there because they love the house or the location. And they don't really care about the amenities. And therefore, they argue that their HOAs are too expensive because of amenities they don't use. Um, have you seen that? Because I have, and I'm wondering if it's, I, I, you know, Atlanta is like Charlotte. It is uh, like ground zero for HOAs. I mean, it's the, the epicenter, right? For HOAs, Charlotte, I'd say Charlotte and Atlanta. I, I don't know any other two cities have more, but what do you feel about that? When you see someone that may have come up to you as, Hey, who pays your, you know, who pays you for, to be here at Windermere? Or who pays you, you know, is that coming out of my dues? Have you heard that? Yes. And that's a personality type. I don't know if that's unique to the Southern United States or just Atlanta or Charlotte. That's a personality type. And that's a, that's a type of person that bought a house knowing they were going to have to pay X in there for these amenities that they don't care about. But the amenities are one of those things that does help your resale value. Because when those amenities are there, when we searched for our house, it was as close to a tennis court as possible. Check that box. So there were certain things we were looking for and it narrowed down our options. I only had three homes in the area what I was looking for. They were building homes like crazy in 2020. Mm -hmm. Everybody was stuck at home and everybody wanted their, their different house because everybody was working from home. They, everything we clicked on was had to have a tennis court. And it was interesting how few within our search range actually had that amenity there, but it was a necessity for us. For others, it's an accidental necessity that you just pay for because that keeps your prices higher. The neighborhoods right. that have these types of amenities are worth more. Of because, course. 
they have something that somebody that the next door neighbor doesn't have. Now, are you on your HOA newly formed board or are you the tennis chair that they look to as the board looks to you? Exactly. Five members on the board. I'm not one of them. Okay. Well, I that's, specifically that's raised my hand and said, I'm volunteering to not be on the board, but I'm perfectly happy to help you guys with tennis related decisions. So tennis and, and pickleball, I can help you guys. It's all volunteer. Right. Of and course. The, the, the guy who is our president is a retired banker. Okay. And really good at what he does. I would be interested to ask him how much time he spends as HOA president, because mm -hmm. I, would, I would not want to have, as I do, multiple businesses and multiple projects going on and a family and a, and a new child on the way. No, congratulations, also, by the way. Thank That's you. Fantastic and news. Go ahead. Also be the HOA president with all of the requests and complaints and financial asks and everything going on. I, I would not want that job. I would guess it would be somewhere in between having a part-time job and another full-time job. I, 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 I totally agree with you. I think the, uh, I always feel sorry for a president of an HOA. And now recently I, I've seen, I've read literature that, you know, some presidents, and this is something about, you know, you, anybody who's out there who's on an HOA board or a board of directors for a club should think about is the liability because there are lawsuits that are coming through now, filtering through to the HOA president or board saying, you know, they were negligent in doing this or they were negligent in doing that. And it's happening at board, at, at board level and clubs too, that, you know, you need to take out insurance for those, those roles and make sure your umbrella policy covers you for those, those volunteer roles. You know, you're volunteering your time. I want to change the, the topic a little bit to what you and your wife are so great at, which is teaching kids tennis and you're well-respected there in Atlanta. I want to hear your story, how you got involved in teaching kids and how you cross sell your wife's wonderful fitness work and how that works in with your junior teaching and instruction. Tell us your story a little bit about how you got into kids so much on the court. Oh, that's interesting. So I've got a, I got to span 12 years in, uh, in my 92nd little spot here. Oh, um, you're, you're younger than I am. So it should be easy. Come on. <laughs> I should be able to pull it off. Yeah. Uh, my, my favorite way to start the story is teaching at, I was a teaching pro at TPC Sugarloaf in, in Georgia, mm -hmm. in, in Duluth. And we had four coaches that were supposed to be out there with our little ankle biters program. And there were 20 kids. So we had a five to one ratio, four pros, 20 kids. The other three pros were late. And I was the only one there. So I had 20 four and five year olds and needed to get started. Cause I also had 20 parents sitting there staring at me, wondering what was going on. So instead of letting them know, I'm sorry, we're just going to have to wait. I, uh, I made a, an executive decision. I found all those little round dots, those little rubber dots and we're on the clay courts. And I just threw dots everywhere. I'm like, dot, 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 told the kids go. I had 20 kids by the time the other three coaches showed up, which wasn't long. I mean, it was five to seven minutes, but that seems right. like it's, it's an intolerable amount of time. When parents are watching. When parents are watching. Parents every are watching. Yeah. It, is, it is tight. Uh, it's stressful. Uh, I had all three of the other coaches walked up and I, I looked at the, the looks on their faces because I had all 20 kids, four and five year olds, doing little bounce downs, little bump, what we call bump downs, bouncing the ball, standing there on their, on their dots, just doing everything they can to try to keep that ball going. And it looked so organized. And I don't know why I had the greatest 20 children of that, you know, of the era ever, right? Yeah. Because they were all pretty much doing what they needed to do. And I had command of that whole, that whole tennis court. And it was really a cool feeling. And I realized, hey, I might have some sort of special little talent for this. And that was relatively early in my career there. So it wasn't even till that might have been 2006, you know, 2005, 2006, something like that. And by the time I left there and started what we were calling ankle biters tennis going into the preschools, there was a parent that called me up and said, my son's in a preschool and they want a tennis program. I remember how good you are at this. Would you consider starting a program for, for the child's preschool? So I went in and ankle biters tennis was born. It was preschool only. And we worked with three, four and five-year-olds. And I just spent a few years only doing that. So I basically became 
really, really good at hurting, you know, children of that age, <laughs> hurting, learning, yes. but, but learning all the little things, the dots are, you can't do it. You can't do it without the dots. It's, it's impossible. They I, have to know where to stand. I the put little, cones out yesterday. You're so true. So right. You need it. It's absolutely required. I've watched coaches. I've hired coaches to work for us that didn't like using the dots. Mm -hmm. And they were always telling me stories of kids getting hit with rackets and bumping <laughs> into each other. They took too long to explain things. I can throw down dots. I got a green one in the front. They're all yellow in the middle and a red one in the back. And I'm like, green dots in front, red ones in the back. Go find a dot and stand on it. They're in line, done, ready to go. It takes me 10 seconds. I've watched other coaches take five minutes trying to set all that up. And it's just, right. I learned you it early. Come up and take my place at the boulevard next week. Uh, <laughs> I had now, and I'm going to, this, this is a great segue. I, I was asked, I only fill in once in a blue moon to, to teach kids and, and, and they have uh, great instructors there. And four of the, the junior instructors are on the high school team and the high school team had a match yesterday. So uh, Ed, Ed got the call. So I was out there on the courts and I had a great, great, you know, all beginners, um, older beginners, like uh, 10 to oh, actually it was seven to 12 year olds. I had a seven-year-old boy, 12-year-old girl, and five, four in between that. So six on the court. Um, I, again, I got cones out because they're swinging the rackets around. I'm seeing a, a racket head going to an eye. But um, I give me a hint here. Uh, I had one boy, uh, and he, he, I think he gave me his wrong name the first time eh, on purpose, and then somebody corrected me. So I was calling him, unfortunately, for the first five minutes of the lesson, his wrong name. But he obviously didn't you know, want to be there or his attention to his attention to detail was lacking pretty quickly. What are some of the secrets you have? And you don't have to give out your best secrets, but give me an idea of how you would treat that one kid that just, you know, mom sends him there. He doesn't want to be there or he has an attention deficit disorder and you have to deal with that on the court every week. What, what, what do you do? I am happy to offer all of my best secrets. I want, I want tennis to be, as good as it can possibly be. So if I've figured something out and it helps other coaches, I am not writing a book and keeping it for myself, you know? Um, with the kids that doesn't wanna be there, they've gotta like you. Yeah. Because they probably either, one, had a bad experience with tennis previously, had a bad experience with the previous tennis coach, or they're just kind of in a bad mood because they had a bad experience with their <laughs> parent. Mm -hmm. which is more often the thing is they, <laughs> they didn't get along with their parent in the car ride over there. We see it all the time. And it's usually about 20%. So one, one kid out of five, yep. either doesn't one of those things doesn't want to be there has some level of attention, just spinning because he likes to spin. And I like that kid because if I can focus him, I can spin him in the right direction, but it does take that time. So you've got kind of, 50 50 the other four kids are going to get 50% of that attention the name calling right and I'm name right. calling in a good way little Johnny Bobby yep. 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 I get their really? names first first five minutes that's why I was annoyed with myself when he gave me his wrong to. name dots and names if the three kids go running away you can't say hey kids come back they're not you got to you got to know the names um, but in that case you got to create a quick personal connection with that one kid that's going to be the the trouble the the more work and the other kids are going to stay in line. You're going to have almost one out of five. That's almost always easy. You never like, have to never have to put them back in line. They're, they're easy, right? It's kind of like my but, employees. One out of five. There you go. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna rename this. The the twenty percent of kids are a, are a pain in the butt rule, right? Um, it's a working title. We'll, we'll work on the name. There. I think it goes into people too, adults as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the reasons I don't work with adults, I think the number is higher. <laughs> Um, but it's interesting because you've got to take that kid and you've got to, you got to really connect with him or her. And one of the kids with the ADD question is the kid that wants to do something that's always pushing, always pushing every once in a while. It's, it's the fear of God. It's I'm, I need you to stand here or we have a serious problem. And sometimes you scare the child just enough. They, they get that little bit of, okay, coach Sean's for real. I can't take advantage of this guy like I do my other teachers or I can get oh, away geez. with things or with my parents, especially. Right. But sometimes it's just the kid that doesn't want to be there. You got to be extra nice to him. So you, as the instructor, find that child. If it's one out of five or if you're in a group, if you got two out of five, you're in trouble. But it's being able to look at them and at some point empathize with the one that's softer, that you're not trying to scare into standing in line but you want to encourage them that it's going to be fun and that they are going to like your jokes. So the ability to 
talk to each kid in a different language, meaning how they hear you, the, the volume, the tone of voice, the things that you say. As a tennis coach, we're all trained in, you got 10 people on a court, you're gonna say how to hit a forehand 10 different ways because they've all they're all gonna hear 10 different things. Right. And you might be able to connect with them. In kids, it's it's not much different, but it's more tone of voice, it's less context. It's less, sorry, not context, content. Content. It's more right. like supportive and uh, being there for them and being a mentor and, a, and an example all in one. Exactly. And so some are going to need to be pushed in, diff- in, in certain ways. Others need to be hammered on a little bit. I've got hundreds of stories of all of these things. And, you know, at some point I'll write the book. Yeah, but exactly. uh, just one kid, I've got to get in his face and say, knock it off or this isn't going to work. And another kid, I've got to almost talk down from being in tears and tell them it's going to be okay and that they're loved and it's okay if they want to sit down for a minute. So hey. it really is being empathetic with whatever the kids need. Yep. And that ability, I think is, I think it's learned as much as it is inherent. I don't think I'm inherently empathetic in the way that my, my wife is, but I think I'm inherently able to find all of the things that need to happen and put them in order of priority and make sure I take care of the kid that's about to bump into the other kid first, Mm -hmm. then make sure the tears don't come, then settle everybody else while making sure the line is still moving and they're still hitting forehands and backhands. So the parents just see tennis going on, but I'm doing the other things, which are actually more important. You know, kids, it's funny. I, I talk to my staff about this and I don't teach that many juniors. Um, I used to, uh, but then in the last 10, 12 years as adult director and director of tennis, I just don't, I don't have that opportunity that often, but I tell my staff and it, you know, I, I don't dis- distinguish between juniors and adults because it's the same thing with adults too. You have to read your clinic. You know, if you see a woman's head go down or you see her racket drop in, in almost like exhaustion of the drill, time to, time to change the drill. You know, if, if you see, yeah, if you see a kid, you know, losing his attention, time to change it up too. It's, you've got to read the drill and, and uh, the clinic. And sometimes my pros, and I'll go out there and catch them at it, they just get into this rote memory of, you know, feeding, feeding, feeding. And, no, guys, you got to read the drill. You got to change it. Got to read the clinic. See who's liking it. See who's not. Same with adults and kids. And talking about your wife, I think you have a great combination there. And I, I want to um, get her pronunciation of her name correct. Could you please pronounce her name for me? Because I always get it wrong. Giovanna. G-E-O-V-A-N-N-A. She goes, I call her Jovi. Okay. That's so probably Jovi's, what puts me off. Jovi's, Jovi's a bit easier. Giovanna. Um, but you guys, I think that's why you are such a wonderful program, because she she really works on agility and movement and fitness. You have the tennis background. And so you're really offering two services to these ankle biters, as you call them. And I think that helps their attention too. it keeps their attention because they might play tennis for 15. Then they go over to Giovanna for 15 and then you're on to games and fun for the last 15 or 40 or half hour, whatever it is. I, I'm just guessing what you do, but take us through that. How do you cross sell your wife's talents uh, in terms of these uh, clinics with the ankle biters and the uh, tennis for children? Jovi's a, a brilliant example of, how you can take a non-tennis player and turn them into a phenomenal children's tennis coach. Because I'll go back to the main thing that I talk about. It's the instructor that matters. The kids have to like you. They come back for you. Tennis is just the thing we do mostly. Ankle Biters Extracurriculars also has basketball and chess. And we have other programs that run in elementary schools and, and preschools. They come for the instructor. That's what they care about. And Jovi is so good with the kids and she's so nice to the parents. And I'm, I'm just a little bit less nice. I'm like, have you written me a check today? Like, I don't want to deal with you. Your kid's kind of difficult. And I'm, I'm a little more blunt. And when I get on the court with the kids, I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm obviously doing everything I can to be Mr. Amazing. You know, you, you are everything you can be. But Jovi's so good at that. And the lesson plans are easy enough to follow that I've put together. They're all games. It's all, uh, what do we call it? It's not dynamic. She does the dynamic stretching in the beginning, but it's all non-linear pedagogy was a phrase I learned a a while ago. It's game-based play. So everything we do, 
I'm not teaching them forehand. They probably don't learn the, the word forehand until they've hit months worth of them because they don't care. You got to teach them what's going on. We call it bounce hit because it's a really easy way for a kid to figure that out. But what am I supposed to do? Bounce hit. Okay. But she's so good at that and making the kids so happy and she's high-fiving and big smiles and she's complimentary. And it's so good from a coaching standpoint, the kids come back for her, right? It, it's less about tennis. It's less about the sport. And when I mentioned earlier about the kid that may have had a bad experience, mm -hmm. we had one kid leave our program in the spring, go to Florida to some summer camp, come back and cancel his plans to come back and play tennis because he had a bad experience. And I guarantee it wasn't the heat. I'll bet it was an instructor that coach. Just, just didn't, didn't do it right. Or, yep. you know, didn't click with that kid, at least. We'll, no. we'll put it that way. So with Jovi, it's so good because we also connect her with our off-court workouts. So we do, when, when she's there, she does a physical dynamic stretching workout because she's Pilates trained. So she, she implements that, and then we move directly into forehands. Backhands, we do our, our lesson Bounce plan hit. going through. Bounce hit, Exactly. Um, and you know, volleys are fireball and we've got four different volley games that we play before we ever say the word volley. Cause the kid doesn't care. It, it doesn't matter what it's called at that point. It just matters that they have fun and, you know, don't hit the ball with your face. It, it's pretty straightforward and easy stuff. And Jovi's so good at that. We take the off court workouts when it rains or it's too hot or too cold inclement weather. We have to cancel our tennis class. Mm -hmm. Everybody else that doesn't have an indoor court, you cancel the class, you lose your revenue. Sad day. Well, we take the kids on a Zoom call and they set up their mat at home and they log in and Jovi does tennis, tennis ball coordination. She does fitness and physical, what we call body awareness with the kids. And she's so good at it that the kids enjoy it and they forget about the fact that they're not playing tennis that day, but they still want to come and hang out with their friends that are all logged in and coach joe that's, or me, everyone that's a great time. idea i mean zoom on a rainy day i mean i'm i'm writing that one down for me this summer i i hope it happens more because the beginners one of the reasons the director of tennis his name is bobby uh one of the reasons bobby brought us over to windermere is because he wasn't in a position to make that kind of bold choice mm -hmm. to say here's what we're billing you per month it never changes there's no rain outs there's no cancellations Let's say you pay your hundred dollars a month or whatever it is for your kids' tennis lessons. And if it gets rained out or it's too hot, we go inside. You're going to be at home. We're going to do these body awareness classes. Your kid's seven and he's got little tiny arms the size of my thumb. Guess what? He could use some downward dog. And these kids are going to get so much better because the strength that happens on these days that we're getting rained out, where parents were already expecting us to keep their kid alive for them for an hour while they did something else. This is simply a way for us to keep that promise to say, we'll keep your kid from five to six in the same way that we were. You don't have to drive to us. And yeah, maybe you got to peek in on them and make sure they're staying focused because we can't yell at the child through the Zoom call. <laughs> you know, it's a different interaction. And we've had what to learn a lot because we've been doing it full time now for over a year. And we've learned a lot. We've changed some ways we handle things. The kids already know, they all know how to use Zoom. They're and they know you all. too. So it's a chance to see you as it's, it's all about the instructor. Yep. Um, let me ask you, you know, you teach kids every day. I'm not one to always agree with, you know, the, 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 the bodies to be the USPTA, the PTR and the USTA. I, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think the USTA junior syllabus is that, you know, the a kid should never be given a fed ball. And I can't, I can't, I I'm like you, I bounce, you know, bounce hit to themselves or, Yesterday, I, I fed them and I, I, I understand that point. Um, so what I had them do is tap it to themselves and then hit. Uh, it really helps on, on eye hand coordination and racket control, ball control. When do you feel comfortable? And every kid's different. But when do you feel comfortable in putting two kids on an opposite side of the net hitting? Like, is it when they first start? with you? Is it after a few months? Is it an age based thing? How do you do that? Because that's one of my questions. I've been teaching this sport for years and I don't know the answer. I'm hoping somebody else does. Oh, I absolutely have the answer and I'm sure I'm right. Okay. Says, Thank you. Says every, right. every tennis coach in the world, right? The worth the price of my own podcast. Here we go. <laughs> exactly. I'm very invested in my own ideas <laughs> and how great they are. 
uh, we, we have our lesson plans and we have our way of doing things. And our way is just my opinion. And I've taken the opinions of all the coaches that have worked with us. And it's not right or wrong. It's just what we do. And so what we do is starting from the premise that the longer a child goes, any player, in my opinion, the longer any, I'll just say any player goes before being placed in a competitive situation, the better their technique will be and the quicker it will develop. So that is the premise where I start. It is, I, I should call it the, the Venus and Serena Williams. I was premise. just going the King Richard premise there. Exactly. It's one of the reasons why their strokes are perfect is because they spent how many years not playing tennis matches. Nobody heard of them until they were 12 and all of a sudden they showed up and were beating everybody. So in, in my and then, opinion, and then they only played once a month or whatever it was. I mean, they didn't play right. a lot. They weren't doing slow, the tour like the juniors do now. A slow progression, right. So uh, three examples. One, one of my first preschool classes had a three-year-old child of a professional athlete. And the kid could whack the ball like no other three-year-old I've ever seen. Some of the other three-year-olds were over drooling on themselves. And it, it just it, three-year-olds are different, right? This kid could whack the ball, pro, no problem. Dad comes in and says, great, when can we get him on a team? I just, I, I didn't even know. At the time, I didn't have my rote stock, I figured this out answer. I said, dad, that's, <laughs> that's not a good idea. He's three. The USDA won't even take him, really. Um, and I said, it's just not going to be good for him. So I gave him a quick little explanation as, as best I could at the time. In our case, I believe that once you put a child in the situation where hitting a shot has consequences, they will do whatever it takes to make the shot. They will get the result by whatever means necessary. And all of your clean technique that you've been working on no longer matters. The sooner you give them that feeling that I can make this shot and I can improve my success rate sooner by doing it wrong, your job just got harder. That's a great point. I, you know, uh, that's a really good point. And, and it's true. You know, I, I, as I teach, my, my form goes, you know, goes to pot because I'm just trying to get the ball back. So, I, you know, I, I'm watching the other guy's stroke or the other woman's stroke. I'm, I'm just like, eh. You know, and then I go out to play and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I get back to the loop. Um, well, teaching, teaching and playing are completely different things. Totally different. And, but, in uh, this, but in this case, with the, with the progression, with your original question, when do you put the kids on opposite ends? We've got three different classes we typically run, six and under, eight and under, ten and under. Our eight and unders eventually get to a game we call hot seat. And it's, you're hitting forehands and backhands in a line. It's hand fed. The coach is standing right in front of the first child. Hand feet a forehand, hand feet a backhand, high five. You're awesome. Back of the line, go through. And there's a little bit of that lesson plan that allows, I don't have to feed a ball. I don't have to know how to play tennis to do this. I just have to know the, the swing, my back swing, point of contact, follow through. Simplify everything. Now you take the six-year-old, seven-year-old and say, hey, you want to run over to the other side and try to hit it back? No consequences. I'm not even looking at them. It's one kid on the other end. Hit it over there. They're in the hot seat. Right? And they run around and swat at it and try to hit the ball. Everything's wrong. And everything I've ever told them is just gone. Right. And I can show that to a parent and go. There's it happens it. immediately. You put the net in front of them. Yep. Exhibit A. There we go. Right. So that's the eight and under group. The six and under group, we almost never do it. Because a five-year-old running around on the other end. I did it yesterday. I'll admit. <laughs> but that kid had been playing with us for months and kind of knew the game and knew what was going on. So in this case, it takes the consequence out it takes the competitive nature out so then we take the next step after that we call is a basic one point king of the court so i hand I, I hand you a ball you hit it they play out the point now when i say play out the point i mean if the kid actually makes the first shot that's hand fed the king is never getting it back it's just not happening so they just learn the consequence of winning and losing we can talk about where the lines are and what's in and out but i took my third example, and I'll, and I'll let go on this one because this is actually, this is the premise for how we do all of our lesson plans for these kids is I took the kids that looked like they were doing really, they were doing really good, doing really well, getting better, eight years old, seven year old sibling. Dad says, tournaments. Yeah, my kids are going to be awesome. And I said, absolutely not. Let me show you something. So they, we took the red dot tennis balls. I took the 18 foot net, put it on the 36 foot court in no man's land across. 
They knew how to serve, couldn't do it, knew how to hit every shot. And I said, all right, here you go. You serve, play out the point. It was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. It didn't look like tennis. They couldn't hit the ball in. They couldn't, they, none, none of the, everything we'd worked on was gone. And I looked over at the father and said, you still want him to play matches? Because that's what it's going to look like. And, and he realized. Old, that how old was this boy? Eight and seven. He's, he's eight, six <laughs> or seven at the time. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Girls mature a lot faster, you know, bodily wise. They, they're, they're much more mature m- mentally too. Um, but I find that it's, it's, it's that nine to 11 where they can actually start to just start to really play over a net and have points. But I, I don't know the answer. You just told me the reason why not to do it, which is, is, is great, is that the minute they start to do it, they lose, they lose f- sight of their form. And that, yeah. So the answer, in my opinion, is as long as they can possibly go without being in a competitive situation, their strokes will be much better. And at least in that case, you're not setting them up to make the tennis coach's job harder. So I don't have to go in and change something. They came. They come back crying. I didn't. Uh, nah, I didn't win. Okay. Well, of course you didn't. It's your first tennis match. Nobody wins their first tennis match, except Abigail Owens. That's a different story. But. You, you went in and you did the second serve. You didn't use your continental grip on the serve. I know I couldn't. I didn't make any of them. I'm like, of course not. Because you shouldn't have been there in the first place, but that's your father's fault. Because they, I'm picking on You dad. can't say that. Yeah, you can't. Sorry, it's your mother's fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, so, so it's a cool thing that they just don't quite understand that the longer you go, so many of the other sports, you just start with the game. Soccer, put them out there, let them run around. Yep. Football, the whole point is to play the game. But in tennis, we can do it differently. We have those lessons where it's not a necessarily a team atmosphere. We have our group lessons. It is the class. That is the team. But it isn't, we need to go play tennis against the other seven-year-olds in the other neighborhood. Number one, I'm already coaching that group too. But th- there's no tennis to be played. If right. you want them to really enjoy what's going on, rather than go home crying and say, it didn't matter if I did it right or wrong, I still lost. That being said, you when we were talking about uh, junior programming and clinics uh, on on a call earlier at the, one of the institute club directors calls, I think you talked about how I have my pricing upside down, and you, this point right now is an actually good one because if you think about it, if the kids are playing amongst each other like high school kids, we don't actually have to work as hard. You know, we say, "Hey guys, let's go out. I'll coach. I'll coach you." You know. Like, my daughter, my daughter's racket 13. between your arms. You're just yeah, standing, right. My you know, daughter's looking. 13. She's, you know, a great player, nationally ranked. She's working on getting her UTR up. If I go coach her, I sit at the back fence. I say, hey, you're catching the ball late or, you know, you didn't put the ball away at this, you know, at this time a couple times. But when you're teaching the three, four, five, year, six-year-olds, you're working really hard. It's and awesome. And so you made me think about it. So explain to me how you do your pricing, because I think this is a really interesting uh, concept. Uh, and so Mike is all yours. I have a friend and he's a really great friend because every February 1st, he sends me a text message saying, this is your yearly reminder to raise your prices. And his point of view is that if you're going to do something and you expect to be the best at it. So the claim is I am really good at doing this thing. It should be a premier product. Otherwise, you're making a low-end product and go ahead and admit it and don't worry about how good it is. But I wanted to create a premier product in tennis based on this age group. So every year I'd raise my prices. It was $50 a a month and I'd raise them five bucks and I didn't lose anybody. And then the next year I'd raise it five bucks again. And it's not a big deal. I mean, it's $5. And the next year, raise five bucks again. And it wasn't it wasn't anything where I realized I was losing any more customers. I wasn't getting the response of why is it so expensive? When we switched to some of our on-court play, now that example is from when we were in the schools and the preschools. So the schools inside a school, there's no pricing structure that they could compare it to because we were the only ones doing it. Mm -hmm. Since then, USTA and some others have come in to do it, but there was no other comparison. So this is what it costs because it's a unique system. Going out into being on court, on a real tennis court with some real tennis balls and a group that looks like what the guy down the street is doing. 
And when I say down the street, Atlanta is a different thing. It isn't what the club over there is doing. It's the guy that isn't certified that has the tennis balls that in his may, garage. may not be a good coach. I don't, I'm not picking on how good of a coach he is, right. but you know, he's charging $30 an hour still, you know, and I'm sorry, it's not 1985. It just, if, if you can, if you can't, if you can't compete with that guy, with how good you are or how well you sell yourself, then lower your prices. But in our case, we just raised our prices again this spring and it wasn't much. We're still in the same number range. It's 65 to 69. So it's not a big change, and but in month, that case, per month? Per, per month. So as an example, that's for our 30, 30 minute six and under group. So it's not a big change. Parents aren't looking at it going, why did it go from 100 to 200? It's just a little increase. It's incremental. And we see all the time here where Bobby at Windermere looked at me. I said, when was the last time you raised your prices? He was like, I think it was 1985. And I think so many people, because of that guy with the tennis balls in his trunk, charging $30 <laughs> an hour, there is always a cheaper option. There is. Outside, in, in Atlanta, there's always a cheaper option. So we are simply willing to say, we are really good at what we do. And it isn't just the tennis that we're offering you. There are, you're, you're, you now have a membership concept that we're offering, even though you live in your neighborhood that doesn't have any tennis courts, you're not a country club member, but you want your kid to play tennis. So one day you could be like a country club member. But in this case, we said you, you're a member of tennisforchildren.com. You're a member. And so you get these discounts. We offer you these things. I fix kids' rackets, the, the grip, when they're chewing on it and sticking it up their nose in line. Yep, yep. I just walk over. I just fix it for free. Everybody else wants their $5 or their $10. Everybody's nickel and diming people. We took it a different way. We said, we're going off court online when, it, when we have nice. inclement weather. Jovi's fantastic with that, with Rejuvenate. And we're going to bill you this per month, no matter what. But I'm going to take care of all the little things. We have a racket exchange program where if you got a junior racket, you can trade it in for the right size. It's free, just trade it in with me. Now we realized we ended up with a lot of really small rackets. <laughs> Kids seem to get bigger instead of smaller. But a couple of years ago, we realized that. I'm like, why do I have a whole lot of 19 inch mm -hmm. rackets on the wall? But it's just those things where you take care of someone and you offer a premier service. You say, right. we're the, I mean, maybe not the best. I mean, every, everybody thinks they're the best at the thing. But in my case, we're really good at this. If we're the best, I'll take it. But I think that's a subjective question. In this, in, this in this city, you can see the difference between our lessons, between our structure and our organization. And I can train. One of our coaches is 14 years old. She's fantastic. She, the dots are out and the cones are out and she knows the games and the kids follow the instructions and now she's an elite level player, so that helps. I probably wouldn't be able to hire a 14 year old. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. You know, sometimes elite players think it's all about them and they're well, not they, that giving. They might, but that's why you still filter through the elite level players. You yes. gotta have the, the kid that loves other kids. Right. Because sometimes the elite level player is the I'm gonna win at any cost kind of player. Right. And that may not work out in the same way. But in our and, case, the the prices are the prices are high. And I don't, uh, the, the last thing I'll say on that concept is uh, Jovi and I were going back and forth and I said, what's our, what's our cost, uh, what, what do they call it? Cost of goods. It's when we lose a customer because we raise pricing. Oh, I don't our, know what that basically it's our attrition rate. Attrition, yeah, cost, right? cost of attrition. Loss so, of lo uh, light, loss of lifetime value. Yeah, basically, loss of customer because too expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, whatever business people call that, you know, the smarty, smarty <laughs> business people. Um, and we said, okay, we're going to go to this membership concept, and we're going to tell her we're no longer canceling. You guys aren't getting your twenty-five dollars a class back when it rains. We're doing this thing. We hope you like it. We think you're going to love it. We were wrong. Only about twenty percent of the people even showed up, but we only lost. We, we said we can lose as many as 50% through the winter of our yeah. current of our current kids and make the same money because we were canceling every other class. So I said, our target is 75. If we only lose 25% because of this new idea, we're still making more money than we did last year. And, and how many people canceled? And how many people canceled? One. 
-hmm. and he was prepaid from a from a something we owed them during the pandemic so he simply wasn't coming back anyway so him aside we lost Nobody can't zero them. people yeah i love the upside down pricing structure i think that does make sense and i i uh i heartily agree that you you've persuaded me to think about that and i think it's a wonderful way of also allowing the parents to know how much more difficult it is to teach the younger you know kids there's and pressure I, there though because you got to do it well you, you got to do it, it well good it's got to be organized you have to you have to believe in that pro- you're not just raising prices because you want to make more money right. you got to raise prices because you believe in your quality there's, you hey, believe what you're doing you sound like any tedx talk or consultancy you know it's exactly the same thing if you think you're good in your industry you you price yourself accordingly and you'll find out if you're good in your industry by the people that come and pay you to do what you do that you think you're so good at. Look at your um, look at your um, wait list. If you right? have a wait list, charge more. That's what I tell every club I talk to. It's a one. Sometimes they listen. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. Hey, uh, to wrap up, my last question for you before I ask people uh, ask you to tell people where they can find you. I'm sure people have questions. Uh, is and and take this as you want, but one of my uh, questions for junior director, whenever I'm a director of tennis, is are you a knucklehead? Is my question to them during the interview, because in and I mean that in a good way, because I think that you're gonna you you are in a way, and I think this is why, but I want you to answer that question. Is you love trying to create things for kids? And you've got to think outside the box and outside of your own head, be it with your knuckles, we, however, to make those kids come back each week. And what you said so wisely at the beginning is it's not about the sport at the beginning. It's about the coach. It's about you. And how do you view yourself? Because maybe I'll use another word on my next interview. I think you will, because if, I, if you ask me, am I a knucklehead? The answer is no. Okay. <laughs> I might have said yes a year ago, but the way I described myself a year ago was I'm a clown for four year olds. OK, the problem is that's self denigrating. And my friend that texts me every February saying you need to raise your prices. Right. Would also tell me that's a negative in the universe and there's no reason for that to exist. So. From a from a question of do I picture myself as a knucklehead, I know what you I know what you're asking. Right. And I would suggest to anybody to take it more seriously, to take that inner, to take that introduction and conversation and that that whole interaction with a child, take it more seriously. Be the perfect interaction for that child. Don't just be silly and goofy and because and, and ridiculous because that's what you think that, that children do. Don't just be ridiculous because you can. And I've got. I'd say an example, I've watched the other coaches that think, oh, okay, it's kids. It's time to be the knucklehead. And I'll see maybe half the kids kind of rolling their eyes and not smiling as much as they should, because at some level you lose a little bit of credibility because the kids also yep. needs to see you as a thought leader. They also need to know you are the greatest tennis coach they've ever experienced. And not just, I like him because he's funny. So you don't lie to them. You don't just make faces at them and you don't just get them to laugh so they don't cry. You really do have to interact professionally with a child. That's its own thing. And that's the difference. What I would say, am I a knucklehead? No, but do I know when to be what that child needs? Absolutely. But that's a professional decision. Hey, thanks, Sean. So tell the listeners and the viewers, because we'll be on YouTube too, where they can find you because, uh, yeah, I'm sure they'll have follow-up questions. I'm sure people there in Atlanta might want to hire you. So where can we find you? Easy enough. Tennisforchildren.com. There you go, folks. Tennisforchildren.com. What a website. I mean, got to come up up number one in every Google rank when you go tennis for kids, tennis for children. I had a kid, 14-year-old, look at me last Friday. He says, wait, you have tennisforchildren.com? I know. That's a that's... great URL. 14 year old. That's a great <laughs> URL, Coach Sean. I'm like, I know. It's my wife's fault. <laughs> she, well, Sean, uh, she was thank the you. one that suggested that. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you and learning about how you look at kids and how you look at yourself while you look at kids, working with kids. 
And uh, I hope uh, we'll have you back on here again soon. And good luck to you down there in Atlanta. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.